Before I introduce our speakers, I want to say a little word about our rules of engagement for today. The Hoover Institution is committed to civil and courteous discussion of ideas and issues. I don't think that's going to be a problem here today, but I just want to say that disruptive or disparaging remarks or conduct has no place in a gathering like this. I ask you also to keep in mind that the summit is being streamed and recorded. So everything that you do and say will be visible to a larger audience in perpetuity. So you might want to keep that in mind. Mysterious and wonderful things can happen when people keep an open mind. Open minds lead to open hearts. And who knows, people might even find true love here today if we do that. So I would like to get going with our first panel. Um, I just lost my speakers. They were right there. And now they're not. Um, I'm going to ask if our speakers are in the green room that they join us. Why am I not surprised? <laughs> would you mind seeing what's going on back there? All right, this is where I get to do a dog and pony show, I guess. Um, one of the things that the film revealed to me, um, and I would love to hear your views at the break and over lunch, is that there's virtually no facet of public schooling today that seems to be working. That all of our efforts uh, to find improvements and ways to uh, move the system forward that there's ample opportunity to work on any facet that, that interests you. What I think challenge, the challenge that that presents is that there's a lot of need for coordination. And I think the opportunity to use a, a vehicle like Hoover and its convening powers to try to achieve a little bit more um, coherence in the way that we all try to move our work forward uh, would be a little bit of a good thing. So do I understand that we have people ready to come? Could you herd them out here? Okay. I said before we started this morning that Hanashek is neither a shepherd nor a sheep. Uh, and here you have evidence of this. Um, anyway. Well, I'll tell you what. I'm going to start to introduce them. Come take your seats, please. We are delighted today to have Andreas Schleicher with us. Uh, he gets the prize for traveling the longest distance to be here, coming to us from Paris. Uh, Andreas is a German mathematician, statistician, and researcher in the field of education. Um, for years, he has been the director of education and skills and special advisor on education policy to the Secretary General at the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development or OECD, located in Paris. His team oversees the Program for International Student Assessment, better known as PISA, the International Test of Knowledge of Skills and Skills in 15-year-olds in more than 90 countries. PISA is the global yardstick that gives countries insight into their relative performance, which directly translates into international competitiveness. Andreas is also a special advisor to ed on education policy to the Secretary General, which means that he is also involved in intergovernmental and interagency activity with the United Nations, UNESCO, and so on. He's received many awards and honors, but in particular, he won a special German award for ex exemplary democratic engagement. Now, I mentioned last night that I've asked each of the speakers to reveal to me their guilty COVID pleasure. And what Andrea said was really wonderful. He said for the first time, he was allowed to stay away from traveling. And he got to discover that he really likes his family. So family time. I think that's charming. Eric Hanischek gets the reverse prize as traveling the shortest distance to be here. <laughs> Uh, he is the Paul and Jean Hanna Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution 
and he has courtesy appointments in the departments of economics and the Graduate School of Education. He has numerous highly cited articles on such things as class size, effectiveness, high stakes accountability, teacher effectiveness, and the wealth of nations as a function of education performance. He was the first scholar, actually, to suggest that we could evaluate teachers by looking at how well their students learned and progressed. And that's the foundation for a lot of the value-added work that became popular in the 80s, 90s, and 10s. He also has an impressive body of court testimony that a focus on outcomes should, be guided, should guide any decisions about how to resource and how to allocate resources in public education. He's the chair of the Hoover Education Success Initiative, and he co-founded an international education research ne network supported by the European Union to encourage collaborative research and scholarship on the economics of education among EU and US scholars. In 2021, he was awarded the Yidan Prize for Education Research by the Yidan Prize Foundation. For those of you who may not know this, this is an organization that is trying to create a Nobel equivalent prize in the fields of education research and education development. And Dr. Hanushek is the fifth laureate. He has a BA from the Air Force Academy in mechanical engineering, is that right? No, economics. Oh, economics, <laughs> hmm. Okay, and a PhD from MIT in economics. He's taught at Yale University, the University of Rochester, and now is here at Stanford. His guilty COVID pleasure, folks, I can attest to this, was extreme walking. <laughs> <laughs> Enough said. Gentlemen, the floor is yours. Um, I think you just go on. Okay. Good. Thank you so much, Maki, and uh, pleasure to be with you here today. At the OECD, we've been sort of monitoring the quality of learning outcomes now for since the early 2000s. And if you think back to this time, the world was very different. You know, technology gave us access to the world's knowledge, and social media enabled us to contribute to this knowledge, and now artificial intelligence is helping us to make sense out of that knowledge. Huge changes. And the, Year 2000, when we started measuring, you know, literacy was about extracting knowledge from prefabricated texts. Now, when you didn't know the answer to a question, you could look it up in an encyclopedia and trust that answer to be true. Now, nowadays, you know, when you look up an answer on Google, you find 10,000 answers, and nobody's going to tell you what is right and what is wrong. Literacy is no longer about just extracting knowledge, but it's about constructing knowledge now. But compared to this, and as Mark made that point yesterday already, you look at the United States, basically the quality of learning outcomes on digital skills, literacy, has remained essentially flat. And perhaps the most important number is this, as less than 40% of students who can reliably distinguish fact from opinion. You can say it's better than in the year 2000, and that was just 10%. But once again, we live in a very different world. Now I know many people say, well, the OECD just sets the bar too high. That's why those numbers are too low. The standards are too high. But you know, one of the big mistakes that we often make in education, I believe, is that we set the standards where we know the students are rather than what the world demands from people. And when you look at this capacity to navigate ambiguity, you know, triangulate information, this is when you use Facebook. These are the skills you need in everyday life as a 15-year-old. So these numbers are quite real. And what you see for the United States, by the way, is true for many industrial countries. Very little performance change. But not everywhere. You can see, for example, why we were sleeping. You could see China or the four Chinese regions for which we have data moving for the top. That's not the whole of the country, but still 180 million people. You can see Singapore moving from good to great. You can see a country like Estonia, one of the poorest countries in Europe making remarkable progress, or Poland and Portugal, other countries in Europe sort of catching up, moving forward. At the low end of the spectrum, you know, countries like Peru, Albania, Brazil, you know, moving steadily forward. Or look at Turkey, 
Another really interesting example, raising the quality of learning outcomes and moving the share of 15-year-olds taking part in education from just a third to over two thirds. So they got access and quality raised at the same time. The most encouraging example is actually Sweden. You know, it moved for many, many years downhill, you know, reducing outcomes, lowering outcomes for a long time. But then suddenly, around you know, 2008, 2009, it caught the wall. It really took action. And you could see actually shortly after performance going up. That really shows that we are not talking about culture here or long societal trends. We really talk about things that education systems can do if they get their act together. No? And that gets you then to the list of countries that you can see in the global education league tables. And they all have a history. No? Now, some people say that's all about you know, money. And if you spend very little on education in poor countries, you can say, yeah, money makes a big difference. There's a kind of steep rise in learning outcomes based on the money that is invested. But for much of the industrial world, actually for every OECD country, we don't find any relationship between the volume of spending up to the age of 15 and the performance outcomes of age 15. You can see, actually, again, Estonia investing quite little, achieving very, very strong results, Singapore or other countries as well. So. But the more interesting finding is this. When you look at time, now here in blue, you see the time that students spend learning in school. In yellow, the time they spend learning out of school. That could be tutoring or homework, lots of things. Now, that's the volume of time. You can see the winner here is the United Arab Emirates, where students spend close to 60 hours learning per week. But then you look at Finland, where this is just a little bit more than half of that time. Huge variability in the volume of learning time. But when you look at productivity, learning gains per hour of instruction, you can see students in Finland or Germany or Switzerland or Sweden, Estonia, they learn a lot in very little time. Whereas in the United Arab Emirates, they spend a lot of time and learn very little. So once again, it's not money, it's not the volume of learning time, the number of instruction hours that drives those outcomes. And you can see, in the case of the United States, it's also more a question of productivity. There's no shortage of a volume of instruction hours. There's no shortage in learning out of school. But it is a question of how do we erase learning gains per hour of instruction. I think it's a very important point here. Now, I want to look a little bit beyond the average. And I think in the <coughs> interviews, you could see that also very prevalent in those discussions. So I bring you once more back to the global education league tables. Now, that's the average performance of nations. But you, know, you pick a country like the United States, and then you look at the gap between the performance of the students from the 10% poorest families and the students from the 10% wealthiest families. And you can see it essentially covers the world. Huge performance gap depending on social background. You ask yourself, you know, is poverty, destiny, is that inevitable? When you look at a country like Portugal, I mentioned already, you know, students with the same social background as those 10% most disadvantaged in the United States do a lot better. And if you go back to the four regions in China, students with that very same social background do as well as the average American students telling us really that poverty need not be destiny. There's a lot you can do actually to leverage the talent of disadvantaged students, to mobilize resources, to attract the most talented teachers to the most challenging classroom, to make sure that every uh, student has access to, to excellent teaching. So poverty need not be destiny. Geography is another interesting variable. The yellow part tells you the variability of school performance, no? differences between high and low performing schools. And the gray bar is about the variability of student performance within schools. If you look here in Finland, the closest school is always the best school. You don't have to worry very much about school choice because the system more or less guarantees that you know, there's very little performance variation among schools. If you look to Israel, it's at the other end of the spe spectrum. Where you end up in what school makes a huge, huge difference. But when you look at the United States, contrary to much of the public discussion, actually, the variability of school performance isn't that big either. It's not just about you know, finding a few dropout factories and doing something about them. But what you actually see is that there are 
many schools from many neighborhoods, many students from many neighborhoods that are actually underperformers within the schools. And that's actually much harder to deal with in policy terms. They fall through the cracks. You don't see that when you look at the performance of the schools, but you can see a huge set of variability in the learning outcomes. And that's true for actually the majority of countries. So that's I think, something to keep in mind that it's not just about you know, finding certain schools. It's really about meeting the needs of every learner, finding out you know, what is the potential of learners, how can schools actually capitalize on that. No? But coming back now to the variability in school performance. No? Some people say, well, you know, if there's variability in school performance, variability in models, public-private schools, charter schools, that is the source of social segregation that you saw earlier on in the chart, no? this large gap between high and low performing students in the United States. And the answer to this is actually very interesting. For the United States and most other countries, this is not about charter schools versus public schools or private schools versus public schools. In fact, that explains very little of the social segregation. Most of the social segregation, that's the red part, actually happens within the public education system. That's where many of the issues, when many of the problems lies. And that's, I think, tells us really that variability in options actually is a source of, of success and not the source of the segregation that we do see. Here's the answer. Basically, on this chart, you want to be in the green segment where you align resources with needs, where you attract talented teachers to challenging classrooms, where you sort of make sure that students from disadvantage get access to the resources you need. But you can see very, very few countries have managed that. No? There are some approaches. You know, Formula-based funding gets now very popular. Uh, career incentives for teachers to teach in difficult schools happens in some areas. But in most countries, you can see they're very deeply on the red side. So if you come from a disadvantaged background, they also give you the worst teacher and the poorer educational resources. So often, our education systems, the way they are designed, reinforce, not moderate the social differences that come from families. I think that's a really, really important point to bear in mind. Now, why does it matter? And the answer is very similar. I come back to what I mentioned at the very beginning. You know, We have essentially an economy of intangibles now. And intangibles about our about knowledge and skills of the people. That's what's fueling our economies today. You can see here the rise, You know, the, the companies had actually increase are the ones that produce intangibles because knowledge is something that you can use in many different places, many different times. No? You look at the traditional companies, you know, in the Fortune 500 in the 1960s, you know, they have been staggering along, they still exist, but that's not where the money is being made. So that's really something very, very important. Knowledge and skills is the fuel of the economies today because the economy is one of intangibles. We can see that in our survey of adult skills, that's sort of our PISA for adults that we now do as well, where you can really see that economies are much better in extracting value from skills of people when they are digitized. Digital companies are the ones that actually use the skills best to translate better skills into better jobs and better lives. And you can see, you know, the production of knowledge and skills when you look at trademark applications, and that's been increasing, but in the last years, dramatically increasing. And again, in, in, in countries like China, more than, than elsewhere. Now, you may look at those two charts and say, well, the United States is extremely successful in the digital economy, now, perhaps the most successful country in the world. So maybe skills are not that important. Well, that, uh, there are many reasons for this. And I don't want to just look at the skill dimension, but skills are certainly one. When you actually look at the past, and this is basically, again, our survey on the skills of adults, where we test the digital problem-solving skills of older workers. Here you can see on the right side, the United States is clearly number one in the G20 countries. It has you know, at least one in five, one in four workers who have decent digital problem-solving skills. And that is quite a lot for the kind of economies that we have today. And now you say, well, you know, in the young generation, we have solved all of that. You know, like young people are all digital natives. They're born in the digital world. But being born in the digital world doesn't mean you're actually digitally skilled. If you look at young people, the picture looks very, very different. First of all, the bars are longer. Yeah, young people have better digital problem-solving skills than older people, but maybe not as good as you thought. 
basically we are talking about every second young person who meet, you meet out on the street with the minimum kind of skills you need for the digital economy today. Every second adult doesn't have them. And look also at the relative position. Once again, you know, in the older generation, United States number one, and today, an average performer. While well, you can see a country like Singapore, where older generations were poorly skilled because the education system was barely in existence, and uh, among younger people, they come only second to uh, Finland and Sweden. A lot of changes. One more slide on the pandemic. You know, we did, we followed the kind of responses of school system during the pandemic around the world very, very closely. <clears throat> and one of the questions was about school closures. Now, first we said, well, you know, school closures depended on the pandemic. So we expected there would be a relationship between the days the school was closed and the incidence of infections in the country. We found no such cross-country relationship. The rare education system, I live in France, you know, schools never closed. No, pandemic actually was terrible but schools were a priority. There are other countries who closed their schools you know, for two years now without you know, the pandemic being terribly bad. No relationship between the incidence of infections and uh, <coughs> school closures. But when you actually look at this and you see the infection rates here by the size of the bubble, but what you see very clearly is that there's a very strong relationship between the quality of an education system and the number of days where school was closed. High-performing education systems had a lot of frontline capacity. They were able to configure you know, space, time, people, technology very quickly to make sure that schools could continue to operate with social distancing and everything. Whereas poorly performing, I think Jim Blue called them industrial kind of systems, the very kind of heavy administrative, they basically got shut down and they are still not reopening their systems. No. So once again, keep that in mind. It's the quality of education, not so much the kind of way in which we <coughs> manage. Thank you very much. That's it is great. At a variety of times, I've been asked to speak on the same stage as Andreas, and I've learned that I should never try to duplicate his slideshow. And so I'm going to just talk about a few key points that I think are important when we uh, sort of focus in directly on the United States and what's been going on here. So I, um, <clears throat> let me give you the overview. The overview it sort of follows on what Andreas had pointed out. In terms of US performance, uh, we've had the PISA test since 2000 and it's been essentially flat. There's been no change in US performance uh, since 2000. That same picture holds for the US National Assessment of Educational Progress, but it can go back farther. So that essentially 17-year-olds uh, in the United States today have the same mathematics and reading levels as 17-year-olds in 1970, even though we've worked very hard to try to change that. Now, the <clears throat> other point that Andreas also pointed out is that we've had ex extensive gaps for a long time. Uh, historically, the only gaps that we measured were black-white gaps, and there was some closing in black-white achievement gaps in the late 1970s, early 1980s, uh, which I personally would attribute largely to the desegregation of schools. Uh, but since the mid-1980s, the black-white achievement gap has essentially not changed at all. Also, if you go to a socioeconomic status gap of looking at the, uh, basically the economic uh, resources of families, there's been a slight but only slight decline in the last 50 years in achievement gaps, even though that's been a focus of lots of attention. Now, when you look at these, um, <clears throat> there are two ways to look at these numbers. One is to say, you know, we really do have to think about doing different things. We've been doing more of the same for the last half century, and we don't see any outcomes. The other way that people 
want to look at these numbers is to say, oh, that's just achievement tests. Those don't really matter. Let's, let's just forget about that because that doesn't really make a difference. Well, I would um, basically say that's a, the wrong way to go completely. We have extensive information now that on average, people who know more earn more throughout their lifetime. But more than that, if we go to the PIOC data that Andreas talked about that compares countries and looks at, at um, over time, um, looks at uh, the earnings of individuals in different countries with different amounts of skills measured by these achievement tests, what you see is that the US rewards skills more than almost any of the 35 countries that are measured in the PIOC data. The return to skills in terms of lifetime of earning is higher for US uh, citizens than almost every other country in the world except perhaps Singapore. Um, but read that backwards. What that says is that the US punishes the lack of skills more than any other country in the world. Because if you don't have the skills, your earnings are that much less than in other countries of the world. The second thing that I would point out in opposition to the argument that these measured scores don't matter is that if you look across uh, countries, developed and developing countries, economic growth rates are driven by the skills of the population, where the skills of the population are measured by these international tests. So countries where the uh, population does better on these tests grow faster. And for most of you in this room, I think you realize that the future economic well-being of a country depends upon growth rates. That's what determines where the country will be in the future. Um, <clears throat> now, the US has done remarkably better than you would think, given the scores that Andreas put up. Um, and why is that? Well, I think we have some compensating features that uh, have saved us in the past, but it will not necessarily save us in the future. What we have is probably the, the best functioning economic markets in the world in terms of mobility of labor and capital, uh, relatively little intrusion of the, of the government, and so forth. We also have been able to import a lot of uh, people trained elsewhere through immigration policies that if you live in Silicon Valley, you realize that a large part of the creative talent was not originally educated in the US. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, it's not clear that those advantages will carry us into the future and that we can, in fact, go along with schools that are not internationally competitive um, and rely on those because other countries realize the advantage of open markets and free, uh, free uh, uh, movement of capital and labor. Um, other countries are offering opportunities for their citizens that previously would have just moved to the US but don't anymore, but they stay in their own countries. Um, and so I think that's the challenge that uh, we hope to get to. Um, the historic answer is to do more of the same, put more money in to, do, to buy more of what we've done in the past, lower class sizes, um, more master's degrees of teachers and so forth. And doing more of the same doesn't hold up against the data because we have not been getting uh, any increased value in terms of student learning. Now, let me uh, just quickly talk about the added challenges of the pandemic that Andreas introduced at the end. Um, there's still a lot of uncertainty in the US about how much the learning loss was, where learning loss I'm using to imply what the kids know today compared to what they might have known without the pandemic if they'd had regular schools. 
Uh, most of the evidence suggests that it's been substantial. The, the initial closures were huge, um, but then the ragged introduction of and back to schools that we've seen across the country, some places do better than others, but the ragged uh, introduction of in-person instruction and the teachers that were talked about in the original um, uh, film that we had um, has led to continual losses. So what, um, what, is the, uh, what does the data say about these losses? Think of anybody who was in school in March of 2020 when the schools closed uniformly around the country. For individuals, these people will, on average today, my estimates are, lose six to nine percent of their lifetime earnings. Six to nine percent lower earnings today compared to what they would have been earning had they, in fact, had the normal schools. For the U.S., the answers are our gross domestic product will be three to four percent lower each and every year for the remainder remainder of this century. We have a $23 trillion economy. There's lots of fighting about how large was the recession and so forth, but most of these answers just completely miss the major factor that this was not a recession as we've seen in the past. This was a reduction in the human capital and the learning of our society and the skills that we will see throughout the remainder of the century. Importantly, these losses are permanent if we don't, in fact, address them and do better than we did in the past. If we just return our schools to where they were in January of 2020, these are permanent losses. This cohort is permanently damaged. Our society is permanently damaged by uh, the lower economic growth and GDP that we can expect throughout the remainder of the century. So one of the things that um, this, this talk is not to, uh, aimed to be a downer, because uh, um, <coughs> this is. While, while you might take it that way, you might take it as a downer, it's really supposed to be just a motivation that now is the time that we do many of the things that we probably should have done before, but we now see with urgency that we have no al alternative but to do these things. And that's gonna be the focus of the conference, frankly, of how can we, in fact, move our schools to a different level how can we make up for the scarring to this current generation, but how can we, in fact, move the skills of our society forward? So the optimistic side um, is that I think parents became much more involved in schooling since March of 2020. If nothing else, they were looking over the shoulders of kids that were uh, uh, trying to do lessons on their uh, computers at home. We have seen a much greater set of options opening up to kids in going in different places. I and mean, part of it, we've seen the headlines in the media has been the opposite. What are the losses to some of our large school, system, school systems in terms of five to 10% fewer kids have shown up in our traditional public schools? But the other side of that is that they're going into lots of different options from charter schools to private schools to pods to groups of parents in, in homeschooling. And these are options that may in fact hold uh, new opportunities. Um, and I think that we've also learned a lot more about how to improve our schools. The pessimistic side, of course, is that the traditional rigidities prevail. Um, and uh, why this isn't a downer lecture, but an, uh, an incite, 
uh, trying to incite you all to move forward is to make sure that we don't allow the pessimistic side to beat the optimistic side. Thank you. Um, we are, um, Andreas and I are going to have a little talk to extend this, but then we will turn to the audience for a question period um, and uh, trying to find out what your interests are and what you think. <clears throat> So Andreas, um, I thought that the first place to start is, is essentially where you left off. You emphasized digital skills and new knowledge and also started to talk about artificial intelligence and AI. Can you expand on how that's going to impact both societies and, and the schools that, uh, uh, or can it impact the schools? Yeah, you know, I think there's a lot of debate whether you know, mm -hmm. technology is going to destroy or create more jobs, but I think what is clear is that it's going to change every job. And uh, in education, you know, the kind of things that are easy to teach, maybe easy to test, are precisely those things that are easy to digitize, to, to automate. We are, we are, we are seeing this, this massive shift. It's no longer just, you know, whether you, what the knowledge that you can reproduce, but whether you can apply it, create from this, and in a, in, in our economies, we see that very clearly. Digital industries are so much better to translate you know, better skills into better jobs, better lives. So I think these consequences are, are, are very real. But when I talk about digital skills, I'm not so concerned about the technological skills. I think people are going to pick this up when technology changes. I'm more concerned about those underlying human capacities. If you do not understand the nature of an algorithm, you're going to soon be the victim of an algorithm. <laughs> If you cannot distinguish, you know, fact from opinion, if, you do not, if you're not able to triangulate or sort of reflect or look at problems from different lenses, if you do not master the ways of thinking of different uh, scientific disciplines, I think you'll be in real trouble. Well, let me extend that a little bit in how I think about AI. People are worried about the introduction of artificial intelligence because it looks like a technological change that's just faster than prior technological changes. So there's a lot more change and people are having to adjust more quickly. But here's, here's what I come, how I come at this um, that's important for you as a European. Um, there are, uh, there's a competing view of the schools that we ought to uh, at this time be expanding the amount of vocational education and the amount of, of sort of workplace skill development that goes on. This is something that mm -hmm. Europe has done much more than the US in the past and um, recently there's been look in the US about whether we should emulate Europe more. But that looks like a, a very risky strategy to me because um, if you give people the skills to the current job, and that's what you emphasize, um, what happens when that job changes? That historically was the U.S. argument that led to basically doing away with the vocational education that was in the schools when I was in the schools and, and just disappeared for the most part, but has been making a, a comeback. If I look at European countries like Germany and Switzerland that have extensive apprenticeship programs, it looks like these programs get kids into work easy, more easily, that this, the school to work transition is easier. But then if you look out to when they're 45 and 50, you see a lot more people out of the labor force at 45 and 50 in Germany and Switzerland than countries that don't emphasize these trainings, which I think relates to the fact that it's very difficult to learn new skills later in life. Um, how, do you, how do you look at that and maybe the interactions here with uh, artificial intelligence? Mm. Yeah, you know, I, I would agree. Actually, I would think that, you know, this dichotomy between an academic and a vocational education no longer reflects the reality of our economies. But where I do think we need to rethink our systems is that we need to give 
people greater ownership over what they learn and how they learn and when they learn and, and where they learn. I see vocational education not so much as you know, an education for a specific job, but as a different way of learning. And yet some young people are very open to this. They like to work with real people, on, work on real problems that have real consequences rather than sit in the classroom. And I, I just think we need an education system that is much more responsive, much more granular to different modes of learning and that better integrate you know, the world of work and the world of learning. I also believe you know, the lifelong dimension in this is so critical. You know, we have still that idea that we can you know, pack up people with all that knowledge and then they're ready for the workforce. Whereas you know, we used to learn to do the work and now learning is the work. And I think the capacity, motivation of people to continue to accumulate skills as the currency in 21st century economies, I think is going to be crucially important. So I, I, I hope that we can retain that element of vocational learning in our education without you know, tracking people into different kind of streams. Now. <clears throat> I think that's going to be a challenge as I see it to get that balance correctly between providing the ability to adapt to new things and providing the skills that the economy is, is after. Mm. Yeah, but I do think, uh, I mean, the great places of work will become great places of learning. I don't think, you know, universities are going to retain that monopoly over providing advanced skills. I think we need to look at multiple places and multiple ways of learning uh, and, and also encourage people to do this. My, my biggest concern actually is that today we see when you look at uh, learning, it tends to amplify initial skill gaps. You know, those people who have great skills, they continue to learn throughout their lives, and those people who lost out at the beginning just don't have anything to do with this. And I think we need to find ways to make sure that people have those opportunities and use them. Now. So we're going to come to the audience very quickly, but before we do, I want to take advantage of your international experience. Where do you think, which countries are really doing well and why, why is that? What, what's going on that we see some of the countries, the Portugals and the um, Brazils, um, that are in fact improving over time, the Polands, um, Estonias, I guess would be too. Is there anything that's standard among them or, or um, what's, what do you see? You know, that's a really interesting question, a very, very, very complex one, but actually, uh, for me, the most fascinating insight in working on this over 20 years is that high-performing education systems, even if they are in very different cultural contexts, have actually a lot in common. It starts with, you know, these high and universal expectations for every student. They just don't have tolerance for failure. And they pin that responsibility on the school, on the educator, not on the student. I think that's very, very important. Uh, you have, uh, the goalposts are very clear. They typically have, you know, quite tough examination systems. You know, you have to, to, to struggle hard as a student, but it just actually helps us. And, and you can see that mirrored in the mindset of students. We ask students uh, of, uh, always a question on growth mindset. And you can see in high-performing education systems, students will tell you, you know, if I study art, my teacher's gonna help me, I'm gonna be successful. In low-performing, Schools and education systems, students often tell you it's all about the intelligence I was born with, so why should I study hard? And I think we create that mindset. The mindset is not something that the students bring with them, but actually that the education system generates by you know, making sure that <coughs> students advance. The second part is you know, how you capitalize on the resources in society, most importantly parents. If you see in East Asia in particular, many people say, oh, you know, in East Asia, it's all the parents that do this work. They, they make their students study hard. But it's actually the education system that goes towards the parents. They create responsibilities for parents. If you're a, a, a teacher in China or in Japan, you know, you spend a lot of time working with parents. And you actually, and this is not just about academic education. This is about parenting. You spend a lot of time with your students outside the classroom setting. No? The large classes they have enable teachers to spend less time teaching and actually doing more on individual tutoring. On, on, on. They, they know not just their subject. They do not, not just know how different students learn that subject differently, but they actually know their students. And that, I think, makes a huge difference, so including communities, including societies, bridging you know, that gap between. I think that's another common, com common home. Uh, making teaching attractive. You know? And this is not so much about making teaching financially attractive, you know, 
Estonia, Finland don't take pay their teachers particularly well. It is more about making teaching intellectually attractive, giving teachers interesting careers, interesting ways to develop, making them research, researchers, designers of innovative learning environments. You can really see that teachers and high-performing education systems are you know, creators of innovation. They have a room for experiment, experimentation. They can actually, you know, and they do that in a collaborative culture. I think that's very important as well, that teachers are networked, they are sort of linked with each other. They work on, again, you know, when you look <coughs> top performer Shanghai in China, if you're a teacher, you know, they have a digital platform in the province where teachers can upload their projects, their lesson plans, so you can see actually what other teachers are doing, but they combine that with reputational metrics. So the more other teachers are going to download your lessons, improve them, criticize them, the more you will rise in the status uh, of the profession. At the end of the school year, your principal will not only ask you how well did you teach your kids in the class, but what did you contribute to the profession? How did you use new technologies, design, you know, learning environments with artificial intelligence? You can become very famous as a teacher. It's what you do in the United States so well with academics. You know, as a university professor, you don't publish because you get some extra money, but you publish because, you know, that makes you uh, recognized. And I think that this is a very, very key point to make teaching more attractive as a profession, to create a higher degree of professional autonomy in a collaborative culture, uh, to move away from sort of very vertical, rigid structures to more lateral kind of ways of drawing on the, on the potential of teachers. The last point I want to make, and I think it's an important one, is the deliberate and intentional design that links resources with needs. You know, on the financial side, formula-based funding, you know, ensuring that the money that schools depend to relate to the challenges they face, you know, geographically, social background, and so on, so that it becomes attractive for schools to take diff to ensure that you get the best teachers for the toughest schools. Now, I think those are also very, very important that uh, actually it becomes attractive for, for teachers and schools to, to go for the, to the, the difficult challenges. No? So th as a final quick question, um, as I look at your data from PISA and the other international tests, there are some countries that have done well and then fall off a cliff, that they start sliding down. And in fact, Finland yeah. itself has fallen from being the top yeah. till 12th or 15th or something uh, in your league tables. Um, what are the lessons from, uh, from that? Because you've told us the sort of positive, optimistic side. What's the other side? Yeah, you know, I think that is, uh, uh, the, the Finnish example is actually a very real one. You know, in, in a way, maybe uh, Finland has gone overboard with some of, when ideas become ideologies, that's the moment when education systems get at risk. And in the case of Finland, you can make that argument that sort of uh, uh, pedagogy became an idea, you know, we no longer learn in subjects, we make everything cross-disciplinary, and those ideas look very good on paper, and when you actually speak with teachers, the experts, they will tell you, well, actually, in the classroom, it doesn't really work. And, you know, subject matter knowledge is actually quite important. And uh, I think that is a big risk that, you know, you get carried away by uh, philosophy, by an idea, and uh, that's, you know, again, why, why I, I believe what is important in an education system is to have a room for different ideas. And, I like you know, the system in the Netherlands, in Flanders, or Hong Kong, where you know, every school can design its own philosophy. Every school is a kind of charter school. They're still part of a public system. I think that's important. The schools see themselves as elements of a public system. But you can pretty much, you know, as long as you deliver good results, England has gone that route with the academies now. And I think uh, to create more room, if you have a kind of national philosophy, like in Finland, that is very risky because if that goes wrong, you, you drag your system down. But if you have a, a system that you can moderate, see good ideas, you know, find the good ideas in the classroom, scale them, spread them, I think you are on a safe side. Well, with, with that, um, we're going to open it up for a little bit of time to questions from the audience. But you have to have, you have, to have a microphone. Uh, um, so right here. Uh, Andreas, I wondered if you would tell us something about what the data says about teacher-led classrooms, uh, so-called so sometimes direct instruction, versus maybe in contrast, a student-centered or inquiry-based instruction. I think some of the data that you've gathered or supervised tell us something about that. I wonder if you could 
relate yeah. that? You know, we didn't observe teachers. We asked students about the instructional practice that they received. So our data really comes from the student perspective. But uh, what you can see from that is that uh, the teacher plays a very central role. Basically, it's the direct kind of interaction and the direct teaching, actually, that is uh, more, that you'd see more prevalent among high-performing education systems. And that sort of... Um, uh, we are always asked why, you know, because I think inquiry-based uh, teaching and learning practices sound more attractive, sound more 21st century-like, but they have very high opportunity costs. If you let students do an experiment, it's a great thing to do, but it just costs a lot of time and, 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 and resources. So that what the data show is that the prevalence of, of direct instruction tends to be more associated with, with better performance, no? as seen through the student. That's the only source that we have. Um, Andres, does your data differentiate countries based on teachers' unions? Yeah, actually, we have that uh, data. We have also done actually quite a bit of analysis on, on, on that question. And, uh, you know, the, and it, is, it, it often comes up. It comes up in every kind of country's discussion. But, my, you know, my, my first reaction to this always is, you know, the, each education system sort of gets the union it deserves. And by that I mean sort of that the... <laughs> <laughs> that the, no, I, I'm, I'm quite serious about it. You know, I think the way we structure our education systems creates the response on the union side. If you have a very industrial structure in your education system, you know, every teacher gets you know, the same job, the same pay, there's no career, you are going to get the strongest unions in the world. You go to Mexico. That's exactly the response. Of the, you empower those organizations to speak for everyone. If you take a more professional approach, you take, you know... Uh, uh, you get a very different nature of the relationship between unions, teachers, and, and government. I give you, you know, my, one of my first experiences in the OECD, I was just you know, very young there, Sweden introduced individualized pay. You know, it was one of the you know, countries with the strongest unions and very much unionized. And the idea was basically that school leaders uh, should decide you know, how they allocate money to the teachers and so on. When they announced that, there was a riot on the street. You know, Sweden is a very peaceful country, but the unions are very radical about it. Four years afterwards, that approach had a 70% approval rate among unionized teachers. Suddenly, actually, teachers saw, actually works for me. You know, I teach in a more disadvantaged school, I get a little more money, or I teach a shortage subject, and, I, and actually, teachers became very supportive of it. The unions changed. So I, I really think that's the way I wouldn't see sort of unions as, as the problem. I think when they, when they are the problem, look at your system. What are the structures and mechanisms in your systems that give organizations power as opposed to giving the teaching profession the power? If I look at high-performing education systems, teachers are very, very influential, very powerful. In fact, you know, the space for arbitrary policy decisions is much more limited in education systems that have a very strong kind of teaching profession, but it's very much you know, focused on the professional side. Uh, probably not answers your question directly, but I think it's, uh, it's, we, we have actually quite good analysis on that. <coughs> Patrick? Um, we need a... People are converging from all sides. <laughs> <laughs> so, Rick, um, I wonder what the source is for your confidence that um, learning gains going forward are going to bake in a permanent learning loss during COVID. Um, because, because typically, when something abnormal happens, when there's a loss of learning, when something abnormal happens, uh, when normalcy returns, there's like a reversion to the mean, and, and the students can make up that ground. So what gives you such confidence that, that those, those losses are permanent? Um, the data. Uh, the, the best data I, I like, th th this might actually apply directly to Andreas. Um, at one point in the past, German schools had different calendars, and some of the schools began their school year in January, and, and others began it in September, and they decided that they should uh, synchronize with the rest of the world, and they did it by shortening the school year for a group of students um, so that they could then get on to the right schedule. And you can look at the German social security data at the income patterns, and you look across age groups, and you see the dip 
that corresponds directly to the shortened school years that these German kids had. Um, there are other places, Belgium, Colombia, Argentina, where, back to Bob's question, um, the unions have thought that they should run the schools through strikes and that there are plentiful strikes, long-term strikes. And you can look at the kids that were in school during these long-term strikes, and then you see that they stand out compared to the kids that weren't in the schools with these strikes. Um, and so the, you have a, a series of observations where uh, this has happened and that it, it it's not the resilient kids that all of a sudden pop back to knowing how to divide by fractions. If you don't have that lesson on dividing by fractions, you're in trouble when you go to algebra. And that, that's what we've seen is that they, um, <clears throat> it hasn't been much a part in my mind of the US discussion about how we catch up. There's been a little bit of discussion about maybe we should have more tutoring but the way much of the tutoring discussion has gone, it might even exacerbate these uh, achievement gaps because if it's all voluntary added uh, tutoring on the weekends, you're gonna find that the uh, upper income kids are the ones that are getting the added tutoring on the weekends and the uh, kids that probably need it more from the losses that were occurred don't get it. Um, so we haven't addressed that problem, as far as I can see, of how to make up for it. We have taken more of the Patrick Wolf view that, well, magic will occur. Yeah. <laughs> Rick, I, I think one thing that makes me a bit more, more optimistic, and I think that this pandemic also has introduced you know, some permanent changes, hopefully, for, for, for the positive. You know? I, in, in a way, I think you can say the last decades have really seen sort of a trend towards commodifying education. You know, we treated parents as clients, teachers as <coughs> service providers, students as consumers. And I do think you know, parents really got part of the equation during the pandemic. And I think this is an energy that could you know, be hugely determining on the future of, of education. I, you know, we, have, uh, we have just received the data from the field trial of our PISA assessment. What's also so interesting to see that you have many young learners who basically go, go back to their teachers and they say, hey, during the pandemic, I learned to learn on my own. Actually, I had access to amazing digital resources. You know, why can't we do things differently? So I think there's going to be pressure from the student. You're going to see teachers going back to their school leaders saying, well, you know, I used to be a great instructor, but I've also become a great coach, a great mentor, a great facilitator. So I think you know, there's a lot of energy in the system to reconfigure space, time, technology, and people. And I, I think if we are good at harnessing this, we could see a different education system. Technology is the most obvious example. You know, I, people said you know, it's all about teacher training on, on, on digital technologies. We have done that for 20 years without any effect. And in, in a pandemic, suddenly you know, it works. Teachers are actually quite good, and, and, and they, the social acceptance for this has changed. So I. I mean, let, let's see how it so, plays out. But. So, so I'll, I'll push back on you a little bit here, Andreas, in, um, in the sense that I think coming out of uh, the pandemic, some kids have actually come out ahead. They've, they've done better, as you mm. say. They learned to, to work on their own. Materials became more available for them to work on their own, and they've come out ahead. But I think that's also led to these expanding uh, uh, disparities that we've seen. Yes, right here. I'm less of a question than reinforcing the comment that was made about a lost year. I'm in the trenches. I'm a physics teacher, remedial math teacher in Catholic high schools. And teachers, I'm a parent and a teacher. Teachers are genuinely disheartened by what we've lost. The kids are at a loss. They're damaged. They, what we have, the bar that was set for us, we are far beneath it. We can tutor. Um, there are kids who are exceptional that have breezed through this, but they're the rarity. Uh, 
it's almost like we need a, third, a fifth year of high school to make up for what has been lost. Mm -hmm. uh, lost income is going to be dramatic going into the future, but it's parents grump about teachers. Teachers, I can tell you, we feel it too. We're, we're in the trenches with the kids, with the families, and um, anybody here who works with Catholic education, I'd love to have further conversations with them, but uh, it's not an easy solution, but the t tendency for schools is to revert back to where we were, not to where we need right. to be. Thank you. Back there. Uh, does school administration vary across countries, and does it play a role in educational outcomes based on any work you've done? It's an interesting question. We look at the governance arrangements uh, quite carefully. The, 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 the layer that relates most strongly to outcomes is what happened at the school level. You know, whether schools have you know, discretion on who they hire, how they work with teachers, how they sort of build their kind of uh, learning environments. That is something where there is more frontline responsibility. You can generally see a positive effect on uh, across countries. Most high-performing education systems have you know a lot of frontline uh, responsibility. That's certainly true for the systems in East Asia, for the systems in in, in Northern Europe that do do really well. When it comes to higher levels of governance, the picture becomes a lot more blurred. And, um, and that, for example, whether systems are centrally organized or federally organized or have you know, power at the school districts, there you can see much less of, of a kind, kind of effect. And the, the one comment I want to make here about the United States, which will surprise most people, the, the system here is you know, branded as one with a lot of local control. Actually, if you look at this through the lens of a, a school, uh, it is a, far more centralized than many high-performing education systems. Basically, your school districts have a lot of power, but if you think, you know, what schools actually can do themselves, you know, can they decide, you know, when to, when to hire teachers, how, to, how teachers work, can they configure, you know, class size versus teaching time, and so on, the room of schools is actually rather, rather limited. So I, I, I would actually say, and, and that is the, the layer that relates most strongly, uh, but Rick, I know you have done a lot of research on this as well, so. Well, I, th I think that the answer is, exactly what you're saying in that high performing systems uh, do well and have more autonomy at the school level as long as they measure performance. Yeah. I mean, the, the key here is that you have to measure performance. You can't just go to a school and say, do whatever you want. You have to have a standard. And that's one of the things that's under attack right now is measuring the performance of schools. Um, that I think is, is a real threat. And plus, you know, I think some education systems combine those two concepts. For example, a few years, seven years ago, England moved towards what they called academies. So basically, if you did well as a school, as a public school, you could apply for that kind of charter status. Uh, so they allow high-performing schools to take more, more responsibility, more control. Lower-performing schools then get more regulation, they get more sort of intervention, more inspection, and so on. So you can link the autonomy with that performance. No. Yes. Andreas, is, the, is there any correlation between the percentage of kids in private education like Sweden, Australia, uh, Netherlands, um, and results? It's an interesting question, you know, uh, and, and the, 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 the reason why this is so difficult to answer is that uh, private and public have very different meanings across countries. You know, once again, if you go to a school in the Netherlands, they are all publicly funded, but they are run by, you know, religious organizations or others and so on. Most schools are run by non-government entities. So call, do you call them public school? Private school. It's not so clear. Uh, and I think that makes this distinction uh, really, really difficult that uh, um, I, I think, again, it comes more to the, f let me put it like this, a Finnish um, public school has a lot more discretion than a U.S. private school in terms of how it operates, or a U.S. charter school, I should say, actually, private schools are different, but, so I think the, the concepts mean very different things in different places. But they're also layered together, so like in the Netherlands, you have Almost anybody can run a school, and there's a lot of religious mm -hmm. or, or non-sectarian of one sort or another. 
but they have to teach the curriculum of the country and be examined by the central mm -hmm. exams. So um, they have discretion in some ways, but not in others. And that's sort of reinforcing your statement that uh, as you look across countries, you get these very different mixtures of how, what is allowed to be chosen and how much flexibility they have. Yeah, I think this is a really important point. In the, in the, in the United States, sort of the private system is almost firewalled as a separate kind of system. In many other systems, private schools are part of that public system. They're you know, subject to you know, the same kind of outcomes. Back. Back. Hey, uh, thank you both. Uh, this one's uh, specifically for Andreas. Uh, I'm really interested in, in the model that you showed earlier uh, about if the, uh, the most proximate school uh, kind of the best choice uh, and then using kind of uh, as a metric uh, variability. I, I'd never seen that done before and I was fascinated by it. Uh, and so um, essentially you kind of showed that if the variability is high, then maybe you should look into choice. Uh, but the ideal situation is that it's low, meaning that wherever your child goes, they can uh, reliably get a great education. Um, and so uh, I'm thinking about that in a practical sense. Um, and I think where the frustration comes for a lot of parents is that they do uh, have um, a pretty consistent variability amongst the schools that they have the choice for. Uh, but that variability is very low. Uh, kind of anywhere they go, any option they have uh, is not a good one. Uh, and so I'm kind of interested in, in how you see that playing in that model where uh, the variability is low, it's consistent across the board, or it's, it's similar, it's the same across the board. You don't have that high variability, uh, but it's low. Uh, what, what would you then say uh, to parents and stakeholders? Yeah, you know, actually I think low between school variability makes a lot of things easier. You know, it makes parental choice better, uh, easier. You can then choose between different philosophies rather than between a good and a, a poor performing school. It uh, makes teacher mobility much easier. But it does require a very strong system. Basically, you need to understand the outcomes in different areas. You need to sort of have the capacity to intervene in, verse, in proportion to success. And I think that's something that we often underestimate, that, that kind of uh, capacity of a system to understand underperformance based on really, really good evidence and then to uh, design interventions. And uh, some of them have to do with money. Again, you know, formula-based funding often plays into this, that uh, the money schools get uh, relate to the kind of challenges they address. Uh, there are some smart systems like this, and you know, the pupil premium in, in the UK is an example. If you have, for every disadvantaged students, you'd get, you know, a certain amount of additional money and then you as a school have to design an evidence-based plan on how to allocate and use that money and be accountable for that. So it puts the responsibility on the school to use resources actually to uh, create uh, equal outcomes. No, but, uh, I, I think that is actually I think a quite important outcome in, uh, in a system so that school choice doesn't become a choice between good and bad but between you know, A and B. No. <clears throat> Um, I think we have time for one more question. Two, the, the, two more the, questions. Two more questions. The, the lady with the hook is coming on to the stage here. And <laughs> Andreas, uh, relative to other countries, um, why does it seem that America accepts or even demands the, a certain premise with how we deliver education? It seems like we have vastly different types of models, vastly different types of outcomes. Uh, is America just culturally different in that we want this, you know, 1800s model, government monopoly, big wall between, as you said, you know, public and private? Why do we have this sort of different problem? I think Rick is better to answer that. <laughs> uh, I was waiting for you, Andreas. Uh, uh, there is a rigidity that I can't explain, frankly in how we look at schools that is baked in. Um, as, uh, <clears throat> as we discussed before here, uh, with, and the unionization question, if you look around um, the country, there are right to work states that, and states that do not uh, allow any collective bargaining, and yet they seem to operate much the same, in much the same pattern as those in union states and that have are more re regulated. Um, and there's a inertia in the system 
that I frankly am not prepared to explain why, it, why it's there, but it is what you point out. We have one last question. Yes. Mm -hmm. Microphone's coming to you. Hang on. Thanks so much for this. Uh, central to both of your talks seem to be the importance and the urgency of improving the distribution of educational opportunities, particularly to economically advantaged student, uh, disadvantaged students. Can you talk a little bit more about the policy implications for that and what next steps for that should be? Yeah, no, I, I think it's, again, it, for, for the, the easy part is really the kind of resource allocation to ensure that the resources are linked to the needs of students and not to you know, geography or social uh, or, or other factors. And I think there are good answers for this that are in use. You know, Australia went first with the formula-based kind of approach. Then you know, uh, uh, in Europe, it's now very, very common. Most school funding systems are based uh, on those kinds of premises so that for schools, it is not a disadvantage to enroll disadvantaged students, but it becomes, you know, part of, uh, can be part of a strategy. I think that's the, the uh, easy part. The harder part is uh, teacher allocation. You know, how do you make it attractive to, for, you know, high-performing teachers to actually go through kind of the disadvantage? And uh, what we found is that financial incentives work less well than career incentives. You need to you know, build it into the intrinsic job profile of teachers. Now, perhaps you know, give them more time to, to work with their students uh, and, and so on. So I think uh, make it the career elevator. Uh, Asia is very good at that. You know, Japan, uh, China, Korea, they deliberately allocate teachers to schools so that actually, <coughs> or it's not compulsory, but teachers choose to uh, the schools where <coughs> they can make most of a difference. I think that's, that's part of this. And, uh, but it's also really about you know, connecting. You know, the, the problem that we often have is we, we push a lot of ideas you know, top down into schools. They're not very good in finding good ideas and, and connecting you know, uh, good experiences across the systems. And I do think that is crucially important in this. When you look at the highest performing education systems, uh, there's a lot of kind of knowledge mobilization and sharing across the system so that <coughs> Uh, teachers move and, and uh, knowledge moves through the system. That's what I would say. To Do I have a slightly different answer and maybe slightly disagreeing with you in this? Um, <clears throat> we have a few examples, and the one that I point to here is Dallas, uh, Dallas Texas, the Dallas Independent School District, uh, four years ago, five years ago, radically changed the way they evaluated teachers and administrators and made it much more focused on achievement. And then they put in a program uh, <clears throat> that gave differential rewards to teachers that were willing to go to their worst schools. And the differential rewards were based upon their prior effectiveness ratings so that the most effective mm. teachers got a large reward and the next most got a, a reward, but less. Um, in two years, they, made, they brought the worst elementary schools in Dallas up to very close to the average of all the schools, uh, of the 130 schools in Dallas. Um, and that, uh, it reinforced two things in my mind. One is the only way we make the schools better in the future is to have more effective teachers. Um, and secondly, that deals with both the level of performance and the way we're going to deal with achievement gaps is to make sure that the most effective teachers, in fact, are dealing with the kids most in need. Um, and so it's a combination of both of those. Mm -hmm. If it's just redistribution of the good teachers from the better performing to the less well performing, we're not going to make it as a country. Mm -hmm. So we have to, in fact, improve across the board. Now, some of those things are helped by the pandemic, frankly. And it, um, uh, I think we also know that we should be individualizing instruction a lot more than we have historically, that we can't have one size uh, fits all, as, as was discussed in the videos. Um, we have, I think, through the pandemic, 
learned how to bring technology in to help individualize instruction. And this is the place where technology really mm -hmm. does have an obvious advantage. And we have technological firms that are doing amazing things in, those, uh, in that regard. Um, but that it's focused resources and the resource of schools is highly effective teachers. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's a great note on which to wrap. I'd like to uh, ask you to join me in thanking our speakers, Andreas and Rick. Thank you.